Hi everyone. In this video, I want to give you an overview of companies' cash receipt and cash disbursement um, processes. And I'm going to kick it off specifically talking about cash receipts. So, um, you know, when we say cash receipts, you might literally think of someone handing cash to another person, or in the case of a business, a customer handing cash to a business that they are purchasing something from. But in today's world, um, the term cash receipt really isn't that simple anymore. Um, because as you can see here, and as you've probably experienced in your own lives, there's numerous ways to pay for something beyond simply handing someone physical currency. And so what I've done here is I've kind of divided the method by the interaction medium. When we talk about paying, or specifically a customer paying um, a, a company, the company on the receiving end, that's why it's a cash receipt, um, the three methods that, that could happen is what we call over-the-counter. In other words, the customer and the company are face-to-face -face doing business, what we call over-a-counter. A virtual environment, where, say, the customer is purchasing online from the company. Or by mail, where a purchase has been made, but then the payment um, or the receipt of cash on the company's part is occurring through, say, the U.S. Post Office. And so whenever there is over-the-counter business, um, the ways that a customer could pay is literally by currency, right? Paper, dollar bills, and, and metal coins, um, or with checks. Now, this isn't really uh, common uh, as far as just like retail customers go. Like the average person doesn't necessarily carry a checkbook around anymore. Um, it's still a common method when businesses pay each other, that they pay by check. And so um, that's why I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But so over-the-counter could be physical currency, could be checks. It also could be by, by swiping up a credit card or a debit card, right? So all of these methods are a way that people can pay for something. Um, when we talk about virtual, well, you'll probably already realize you could use your credit or debit card, right? Everyone who has bought something from, say, Amazon has done this before. Um, and when it comes to companies, um, they also tend to use something called electronic fund transfers, um, where basically they have already instructed their bank to talk to the other business's bank and on a specific day to transfer a certain amount of money to pay a certain bill. Right? That's called an electronic fund transfer or an EFT. And then, of course, if you're doing business by mail, typically the only way that um, cash receipts occur by mail is, is through checks. Um, typically, you're not encouraged to mail physical cash, and obviously, you're not going to mail somebody your credit or your debit card. Um, and so the method of payment really is determined by the interaction that's taking place. Now, one thing I want to note here specifically is that depending on which scenario you're in, um, the risks to your cash are going to vary significantly. And so when I, when I say that, I, I mean, let's talk probably the riskiest of all, the over-the-counter, the traditional method of doing business. Let's just talk about what happens um, in that situation. And I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go ahead and kind of list out what happens here. So first of all, customer gives cash to a cashier, right? That's typically how that starts. Um, customers buying something, they hand cash to a cashier. And I say cash, obviously it could be a check as well, but, but if we're talking the riskiest scenario, they hand cash to a cashier. The cashier puts that money in their cash register, right? At the end of a shift, the cashier is gonna count the register. The cashier is gonna give the register over to a shift manager of some sort, and the manager is gonna count the register, right? And so what's going to happen at that point is um, uh, the, the, the uh, essentially tally of the sales from the register are going to get recorded into the accounting system. So um, the, the transactions transfer to accounting system, right? And then at some point, someone that is not involved in that transaction recording process uh, has to take the money itself, the bag of money, to the bank, right? So someone not involved in recording transactions takes money to bank. Now you may be thinking, this is super particular. Right? Like, why is it this particular? And it's because of the risk involved. Think about every step of the process. Somebody is handling physical money. 
right? When the customer gives money to the cashier, the cashier could pocket some of that money. When the cashier counts their register, they could pocket some of the money. When the manager counts the register, they could pocket some of the money. When the person takes the money to the bank, they could pocket some of the money. But the only thing in here where you're not pocketing money or don't have the potential to pocket money is this right here, the transactions transferring to the accounting system. But here's the deal. If any one of these people are the ones recording the transactions, they could hide pocketing the money because they could just leave the transaction out and keep the money for themselves. And so this is where an idea of segregation of duties comes in, in that this right here has to happen separate. The recording of the transactions has to happen separate from the handling of the physical cash because of the risk involved of theft, okay? Now, again, I, I, said, I said when I started this conversation, this is the highest risk scenario. When you have a check, a check is typically written out to the business. And so it's not going to do, say, the cashier any good to steal the check. It's not going to do the manager any good to steal the check. And it's not going to do them any good to fudge the numbers going into the system because the check is written out to the company. And unless they have authority on the company bank account, they're probably not going to be able to cash that check. And then credit and debit cards also keep this more secure because then there's no physical cash or physical check for someone to actually steal. The best someone can do in this scenario is actually somehow lift your credit or debit card number and then try to reuse that number um, later. But more often than not, uh, the cashiers and the managers, they don't see those numbers, right? A customer swipes their card um, and, and the number really never changes hands. Uh, now, of course, this is different. Like United States, restaurants, very common to hand your card to say a waiter. You go overseas, different story, right? There, the customer maintains possession of the card. So it really depends on where you are and what the customary habits are. So that's kind of your over-the-counter scenario with respect to risk. Virtual environment. Virtual environment, because the banks are handling the fund transfers directly, or again, you're in a credit card, debit card scenario, much less risk, nothing physical for people to take. The worst risk you have here is basically there is a potential for an employee to route money to a personal account. So in other words, an employee that has access to the internal payment system of the company could try to put their own bank account number um, in place of, say, a company bank account number and, and route payments to their own bank account. Has it happened before? Yes. Uh, do people get away with it for long? No, because it's something that, that can be caught if the company has the right safeguards in place, the right what we call internal controls in place. Um, and then by mail. Well, by mail, uh, you know, pretty much your risk there is, uh, say, like a, a postal worker steals the check or the mailroom person receiving the check steals the check uh, or someone along the way steals the check. But again, you're dealing with a check and checks are written to companies and it's unlikely anybody else can really cash it. And so the risk there is, is actually um, pretty low at the, at the end of the day. All right, let's talk about disbursements. So we're gonna move to the other side of this. What if we're the company and we're paying the money? Um, basically, there's a handful of reasons that companies pay money. Um, they do it to pay off an expense. So, so right when an expense occurs, they say, yep, thank you for your service, here's the money. Or they do it to pay off a liability for a prior expense, right? Expense happened. Uh, but you didn't pay, you agreed to pay later, now you get the invoice, you pay off your invoice. Uh, or they spend cash to purchase some other asset. I usually refer to this as an asset swap because cash is an asset. So you give up one asset, you get another asset. Or they return capital to investors. This is a cash dividend, right? You pay out your investors part of their capital back. Um, those are kind of the main reasons that a company is going to spend cash. Uh, there's not really much else because anything you can think of kind of fits in one of these categories. Cash from a company is typically dispersed using a check, as I mentioned before, or an EFT. Companies, unless they're really tiny, family-owned, that sort of thing, they're not dealing with physical currency, not usually. Maybe as a petty cash fund, that's about it. Um, and businesses control the disbursement basically using a, a voucher system. Now, this is typically pretty automated in, in today's world. And when I say automated, I don't mean there's no human interaction. I just mean 
um, it's it's systematic. It's 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 electronic. It's not physical forms anymore. But typically, what happens is whichever employee within the company um, has requested to purchase something, um, they they essentially are creating what's known as a voucher, um, usually digitally in a computer system, and that voucher receives a certain number of approvals based on company policy of okay, yes, we approve this purchase, and then what's going to happen is the other company, the one that you're buying stuff from, is going to send an invoice to you. And so when that invoice gets to accounting, they're going to match that invoice with the approved purchase voucher, and they're going to give the sign off that, hey, this is a valid transaction and this should be paid. And then somewhere else in the company, that payment will then be dispersed um, after probably getting another round of approvals. That's basically the voucher system in a nutshell. I'm giving it high level overview here, not going into too many details. Um, and again, it's mostly electronic, but it basically controls um, uh, cash disbursements in the sense of unless you have the proper approvals according to that approval system, uh, cash isn't going to leave the company. And that's the idea. You want your cash to stay in uh, unless it has been approved to leave. Okay? And again, that's usually done through check or um, electronic fund transfer. All right, that's it. That's kind of your overview, cash receipt process, cash disbursement process. Again, I didn't go into like super deep detail. I was kind of just giving you a high level idea of what happens when payments are made um, or payments are received and, and how the risk can vary. Um, there's not a lot of risk on the disbursement end if you have the proper voucher system in place, but you can see on the receipt end, um, depending on the exposure to physical currency, your risk actually could be significantly higher. So that's it for this one. Um, thanks for watching. I hope you uh, found it helpful, and I hope you join me for another video.